All right, we come to chapter three now. And again, Peter is really not telling you how you should be living your Christian life. And there's things that you should be doing that you're not doing. And if you really want to be more holy and be more pleasing to God, then you have to be living perfectly like this. And if you're not, then, you know, you're walking in disobedience. No, that's not at all what Peter's saying here. He's speaking to the body of Christ as dearly beloved children of God who are born again through faith, by grace through faith in the precious blood of Christ. We who have an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away. And he's telling us that Christ is our reality today in this moment in untenable situations. Here's a survival guide, how to survive the situations in life as a believer that are real. And it's not by don't do this, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch, but it's through Christ, through exercising faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, knowing who you are in Christ, knowing what you have in Christ, and learning how to fellowship with Christ. You just, you focus on Christ. Don't worry about everyone else. Don't try to fix the situation, but you enjoy the inheritance that you have as obedient children and our obedience is just to come forward by faith in the precious blood of Christ and let your mind be renewed let your conscience be satisfied knowing that you're complete in Christ and that is our witness that is how we survive in situations that we can't control you can't control your past you don't know your future and if you keep wallowing in the thing that you're going through right now, it's only going to get worse. If you try to, you know, be loud about it, other people are going to buffet you for your faults. So all you can do is just enjoy the fellowship with Christ and not try to get the last word in. So he's already told us in chapter 2, how Christ is our example, um, who was slain, who was slaughtered, yet he didn't open his mouth. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, and there's no guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled against, he didn't revile um, back, um, but he committed himself to the Father. And whether, you know, for, for us as believers, there's going to be both the non-believers who are going to try to find every reason to attack you and to make you break um, because you're standing fast in the gospel and you're holding fast to the word of God, even if it seems rebellious <laughs> to them because you're, you know, you're not going with the flow of the world but you're believing the gospel and you're holding fast to the truth of the word of God, they're going to try to f buffet you for your faults. You're just holding fast to the truth of what the word of God says, and they're going to buffet you for your faults. Um, all you can do is just don't try to justify yourself or speak evil against them, but trust yourself to Christ. You know, Christ is the judge and you know, he wills that no one perishes, but all come to the knowledge of the truth, repentance, which is metanoia, which is a change of mind from non-believing to believing. And also the religious people, there's religious Christians who are zealous for the law. They're zealous for a holiness apart from Christ. And Peter already says, hey, the glory of man is as the flowers of the grass and all flesh is like grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade away, but the word of God endures forever. And this word is the gospel that's preached unto you. So there's a, there's Christians who are living in disobedience as far as the Christian life. And they're not living Christ. They're, the gospel is just, for them, it's just the beginning of the Christian life. It's not the entirety of the Christian life. 
they're not living Christ. They don't they don't see the gospel as much of importance because they're only taught that, you know, just by being born again, that means you go to heaven and the rest of the Christian life, it's by commandment keeping. And so they read the rest of the Bible as commandment keeping and their whole life they do, they're doing things out of commandment keeping and to build some sort of glory for themselves. But they're living after the flesh, even though they're saved. And the higher you climb that ladder of religi religiosity and trying to be approved by men and seeking a reputation from men and trying to work for a wage or doing things because you're not trying to get punished or you're trying to prove to other people that you're you know, more holy or prove to God that you really do love him through X, Y, and Z, the more strife and division, malice and guile and hypocrisies you're going to have um, towards one another. And there's not going to be that unfeigned love towards the brethren. There's going to be a, like a facade. You know how Moses came down from the mountain? He, he covered his face. He realized that because the, the, he received the law and his face was glowing because of the, the Shekinah glory. But he realized that that glory was fading um, and so he was covering up his face. It was, it was too bright to look at, but at the same time, he realized that it was fading away, so he covered it. And, and so when someone is trying to have a, a, a glory based on the works of the law through commandment keeping and trying to appear more moral and more holy and more righteous than they actually are, more spiritual than they actually are, you're putting a facade on. And it's going to affect your family. It's going to affect the fellowship. It's going to affect... Uh, your conscience towards the Lord, and 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 it's like, as uh, Peter says, hey, you have purified your souls and obeyed the truth through the Spirit through unfeigned love. So it's it's you're gonna realize, man, like my soul, my affections, my emotions, my thoughts are not gonna they're not pure anymore. You're gonna you're gonna have a conscience that's. Um, kind of going against the truth because you're really not walking by faith in the blood of Christ. You're you're being found in Christ and not um, having a righteousness of your own, which is of the law, and not which is based on God, based on faith. A righteousness of God based on faith. And so the whole point is, you know, is to put Christ on display, to show forth the praises of Christ. And... When when religious people like that see other believers who are resting in Christ, who who are just there's a fragrance of Christ from from that believer. They're not boasting in their religiosity. They're not trying to tell everyone what they're doing. And if they don't tell, you know, you what they're doing, then you're gonna think that they're lazy. No, they don't care about. They don't fear man. They don't. Fear, they're not trying to have a reputation in in the religious crowd. The religious Christian will attack you. The religious Christian will try to buff you for your faults and say that you're lazy. And that you're not, you know, that you're just being a consumer. They're going to try to buff you for your faults. And then when you say something back to those religious Christians, now they have something against you now. Now they, they're now, see, oh, see, oh, you're just attacking me now. Oh my gosh. I was just trying to, you know, help you out in your Christian life. And now you just, you know, attack me now. So... And, you know, there's some situations where it's just like, it's, I need not to justify myself before man because I know who I am in Christ. I'm an heir of God. I'm declared righteous. I have an inheritance that's incorruptible. I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I'm accepted in the beloved. And God sees me in Christ. And I don't have to justify myself before the religious crowd or play the religious games. I don't care what their opinion is. I know what God's opinion about me is. And I'm in a fellowship with him and enjoy Christ. And that's what Peter's telling us to do. That's that's what's acceptable. You know, we take we take those, you know, there's no glory. There's no glory if you try to justify yourself. And you, then you get buffeted for your faults for trying to justify yourself. No, you just take it patiently and trust yourself to the Lord. And knowing that Christ is your righteousness. Christ is your sanctification. Christ is your reward. Christ is your wisdom. And they're not going to, you know, some religious people are not going to understand you know, because they're veiled by the law. And so when we come to chapter 3, 
after uh, Peter says, hey, look, you know, we were as sheep going astray, but we, now we are, have returned to our shepherd and bishop, um, the bishop of our souls, the overseer of our souls, who is Christ. He is our good shepherd. He leads us into rest. And today, right now in this moment, I, I'm going to come forward by faith in, in, in the blood of Christ, who is my shepherd, who laid down his life for me. I'm not trying to do something for the Lord, but I, but my obedience is faith in the gospel. I'm going to preach the gospel to myself and thank the Lord. Just in my spirit, thank you, Lord, that you're my good shepherd. You lead, you lead me down by the still waters and you restore my soul. And you're the green pasture and I can eat and drink of you and be satisfied today. You're my joy. And in, the, and in that preaching of the gospel right now, my mind's renewed in Christ. I'm not focused on my situation. I'm not focused on my flesh. Nope. All that's passing away. But what's true is the incorruptible materials, the blood, my inheritance, the faith, um, and the reality of who Christ is to me and who I am to him, in him, and to him. I'm accepted. And he's, he's taking care of my situation. He's working all things together for good. And it's the coming forward by faith in what's true in my union with Christ, he, I've been brought near with by his blood. That's going to affect my soul, my soul life, my emotions, my thoughts, my feelings, my affections. And I can rest. And so we come to chapter three. And he, likewise, he already talked about the, you know, if you're the servants, if you have a master, it's like, hey, you know, knowing that the Lord is the ultimate authority. And if you're in a situation where you can't change it, whether it's a workplace or family situation, whatever it is, um, just entrust yourself to the Lord. And if you have the freedom to, to, to get yourself out of that situation, then get yourself out of that situation. But in this context, you know, we, we don't fear man, we fear the Lord. We, we don't, if man is trying to tell you to do something that's against the word of God, then the word of God is the higher authority. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to, or I'm not going to let my conscience be, um, out of ease if it's going against my conscience what this person is telling me to do then I'm going to obey we ought to obey God rather than man and I'm going to entrust myself to the Lord um, so in chapter 3 here in verse 1 likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives or conduct of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation or chaste conduct, that word chaste is uh, pure from carnality, um, pure from the fault. So the, the carnality is in the context is the religious, the religious flesh of one-upping one another um, as they behold your chaste conversation or chaste conduct coupled with fear, the fear of God, not the fear of man, trying to man-please, um, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of uh, plating the hair or arranging the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. So it's not the externals. It's not trying to improve the flesh to try to change your situation in the household but let it be of the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. He sees contrasting even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. So in, in this negative situation, all you can do is come forward by faith. That's your priestly service. You just enjoy Christ. If you're if you're the husband that you're married to is a non-believer, he's without the word. He has not obeyed the word, which is to believe the gospel. By nagging him and nagging him to try to you know go to church, do this, do that. You know you should try to read your Bible. You should do this. Why aren't you doing that? It's only going to push him further and further away from Christ. So, what you all you can do in this situation. Because you're already joined to him now. And that marriage is sanctified. 
he's not saved, but you're saved as the wife, all you can do is keep coming to Christ and you enjoy fellowship with Christ and let Christ be real to you today and the fragrance will um, emit life unto life or death unto death. But all you can do in the situation is bring Christ into your situation. <laughs> Just live Christ. And the fragrance of Christ is your weapon. And your faith in Christ and, and your fear, the fear of God, which is your acknowledgement that Christ is present in your situation. And he's real to you today. And I don't, you don't have to try to manufacture something. That's going to be, you're going to win over your husband. It's not really an outward, you know, loud mouth, <laughs> but it's that quiet, that meek and quiet spirit. And that, that when, so when Christ, who is your life, is being enjoyed in your spirit, he, you know, Christ is going to spill out into your heart, your affections, your emotions, your thoughts, all of that. Or, if your husband is a believer and he's just currently not obeying the truth as far as a Christian life, he's very religious. He's doing a lot of works. He's very zealous, but he's trying to build something in his, you know, in, in the religious world and it's affecting the marriage because that happens. Religion and religiosity and legalism will greatly destroy um, the fellowship um, in the body of Christ, in the, in the household, you can appear religious in front of the, you know, you know, the body of Christ, but then how's the car ride home? How's the household? You know, is it full of strife and division? Because, you know, the, you can't, you can't put on a facade. You know, we, we know who we are in the household. We can't, we have to stop trying to appear more religious than we are. And the, the reason why that happens, most situations and issues in the family happens because of religion is a, is a legalistic base of the Christian life. You can't live up to the standard that you're putting yourself under and you're putting that same standard on other people and you're expecting them to live under it. Um, and it just becomes a competition war. You know, like in a like Abraham, you know, after he went into Hagar and birthed Ishmael, um, just a picture of... Um, the works of the law, um, going back to the law for the Christian life, trying to earn God's blessings through, you know, you manuf manufacturing something in the flesh. You know, Hagar was persecuting Sarah and, you know, lording over, bragging of, bragging about Ishmael, you know, being the heir. And, and it, there's a lot of strife in the house, the works of the flesh. So for the wife, instead of, firing back with trying to justify yourself of why you're not being as religious as he is and the husband is just so zealous for politics or for you know this conspiracy theory or that you know prophecy that has to do with this and that and and no no everyone needs to see this it's you know this is the mark and it's just like dude this guy is not obeying the truth and all he can talk about is anything else but christ and there's just no fellowship in the house and it's horrible. Like, what can I do in this situation? I can't change him. He's, his heart is so hard. He's veiled. All I can do is to, is to fellowship with Christ. Like, let Christ be real to me in this moment. Just fellowship with him. Let, we have to learn how to fellowship with Christ and believe the gospel. You just to believe the gospel. You purify your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit. And there's that unfeigned love where you... All you can do right now is just believe the gospel and acknowledge him if he believes the gospel as a brother in Christ and let Christ change his heart. That's all we can do in that moment. So, and while they're beholding your chaste conversation, you're not reviling in return and you're fearing the Lord, not man. Um, and you're not trying to manufacture something through the externals, but it's just the hidden man of the heart that's you're enjoying the what's real to you and which is christ he who's joined to the lord is one spirit and and it's a spirit that gives life the flesh profits nothing 
that's of great price when you're just enjoying Christ. Um, for after this manner, verse 5, in the old time, the holy women also trusted in God, adored themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Abra even though Abraham was a mess, and so was Sarah. She wasn't perfect either. She knew that she was a sinner, and, but she also believed in the promise concerning the seed that would come. So she was justified. That's why this is holy women, because she was justified by faith. Not because of her lifestyle or what she's doing or what she's not doing. No, because Christ is the holy seed. Christ is the holy one. And she believed in that the seed would come, even though she told Abraham to go into Hagar. Um, God sees you not based on your track record of your past. That's blotted out. He sees us based on the righteousness of Christ through faith. So she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with fear, uh, afraid with any amazement. So that's in contrast to a uh, meek and quiet spirit. So the example here is just exercising faith in what's true. And that's what doing well is. And it talks about you doing well. Doing well is coming forward to the throne of grace, where we find grace and mercy for help in time of need. And he's already mentioned doing well in verse 15. For it is the will of God that ye with well-doing may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Knowing that you're free in Christ. Knowing now I have, I have liberty in Christ. I'm not going to rail against this situation or else it's going to make it worse. And I'm not going to speak with malice. I'm not going to hold any root of bitterness towards this person. No, I entrust myself to the Lord. And I value them as a person, as a brother in Christ, if they're saved. Or if they're not saved, I'm going to I value them as a person. But for my conscience towards the Lord, I'm going to exercise faith toward, towards the Lord. And in that, I'm going to follow Sarah followed Abraham. Um, and because her faith was in the Lord, you know, she ultimately trusted in the Lord. She didn't want to lord over him, even though maybe she knew some of the decisions that Abraham, you know, were bringing them into were not the best choices. Um, but as you know, it didn't go against her conscience and she just trusted in the Lord. Um, obviously if, if it's against the word of God, then you can use your freedom get help, you know, if you know, there's an abusive husband, you can use your freedom to leave, separate, get a job, you know, get counseling, pray to seek to, you know, for reconciliation. But in, in situations where it's just like, okay, there's nothing really I can do right now. I'm just going to obey the Lord by just obeying my husband. And I'm not going to be afraid of what, what's going to happen because I'm trusting myself to the Lord. That's what he's saying. That's what doing well is. It's believing the gospel. Um, letting Christ be real to you today. Fellowshipping with Christ today. And then verse 7. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. As being heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers be not hindered. So now he's talking to the husbands. Dwelling with your wives according to knowledge giving honor unto them with understanding. Um, look, we're both, we both have a flesh, a sinful flesh still. And I'm not going to expect any more of you than you are of me. No, we both need the grace of God. But as, but she's a weaker vessel. You know, Paul talks about, we have this treasure in this earthen vessel. They're her, it's not her flesh in general is weaker. Um, you know, I'm more, you know, I could tame my flesh more. No, we acknowledge that both of our flesh is corrupt, but the weaker vessel as far as just, you know, physically and, you know, emotionally too as well there. And I acknowledge them that I don't, I don't lord that over them. No, I just acknowledge that I understand this and I give honor. I actually value you because of that. And my job is to, you know, I need to come forward by the blood of Jesus Christ. I need to enjoy Christ myself. 
and get rid of my religiosity and stop trying to, you know, have this ministry, that ministry, and this is my life, and look at me, I'm, you know, being a man of the household. No, no, your first ministry is your wife, and you need to cherish her and love her and value her, see her as a daughter of Christ. And that's by you first obeying the truth, letting your soul be purified through the washing of the water of the word of God. You let your mind be renewed in Christ. And you walk in the spirit. And you have to see your death to your flesh. You're not better than your wife. It says that we're heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers not be hindered. If, you have, if you're trying to one-up her and you know you're angry at her or you're just bitter in your relationship there's not going to be a fellowship in prayer there's just that, that hindrance when you're when you're praying together you know you want you want that flow to just be smooth because you're enjoying christ yourself and when you see your wife you know that you're an heir together of the grace of life and you're and you have a sweet fellowship and there's a fellowship in prayer and it's going to be hindered. That fellowship is going to be, a prayer together is going to be hindered. Uh, whether there's no prayer together at all, like it used to be. Because religion started taking place. And your works and your your personal holiness is above of, of enjoying Christ. And then enjoying Christ together. Um, you're an heir together. We're told that in Hebrews, in multiple places... That Christ is the heir of all things, and in him all things consist. And he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit, and he's given us the spirit, which brings the reality of Christ to us, that confirms to us to, with our spirit that we are children of God. And, and if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If you and your wife are both believers, you are heirs together of the grace of life. We both need the, the, the grace together. We're equally royal in Christ. We equally are qualified. Um, God has qualified us through faith in Christ Jesus to partake in the inheritance and the saints of the, of the light. We have both been delivered from the power of darkness and we're conveyed to the kingdom of the son of his love. And we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We forgive based on Christ forgive us. And... We're heirs together. We have to see ourselves as that and look past, look past the flesh, valuing one another as children of God and as human beings, understanding that the wife is a weaker vessel and that's something to rejoice about, not something to lord it over her um, or look down upon her. No, but you're heirs together of the grace of life and all we can do right now is enjoy the union of marriage that we have together as heirs of God. And let's pray together. Let's enjoy the fellowship of prayer. Push aside the malice and hypocrisies and evil speakings. And let's both believe the gospel and enjoy the grace of life. There really, it's really, it really is the grace of life. Grace is God giving you Christ and he gives us Christ by the spirit Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's enjoy that truth together and rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Um, many pastors take this verse and say, see, if, if you're not being this perfect husband, if you're not being this perfect wife, you know, they, they make this a commandment. This is not commandment keeping. No, this is a survival guide in unintendable situations. And how do we deal with it? Through Christ. God brings Christ into our situations and we're learning how to not get the last word, but let Christ be the last word and how to fellowship with Christ, knowing that he is my shepherd, enjoying the incorruptible materials um, that fade not away and receiving his comforts in the midst of, a, of situations that we can't control. Even if we're being buffeted for our faults by the religious crowd, by the non-believing world and you just enjoying Christ yourself and letting your conscience be renewed, your mind being renewed by the truth of the gospel and 
your you just knowing that you're a fragrance unto God in Christ Jesus, and as you're enjoying that fellowship, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Your joy is being full. That's going to silence the foolish, the ignorance of foolish men. That's going to win over, um, you know, the non-believing husband or the husband that's not walking according to the gospel, but walking according to the religious flesh. All that. That way, the way that we deal with every situation is Christ. And that's commendable. That's our priestly service. It's presenting Christ, not our righteousness, not trying to justify myself, but enjoying the grace of life as an heir of God, knowing who you are in Christ. Um, so pastors take, again, pastors take this verse and they make it a commandment. And they'll say, see, if you, if you do this, then your prayers, God will hear your prayers. If you don't do this, then God will not hear your prayers. It's possible. And then they'll go to the Sermon on the Mount and say, see, if you don't forgive others, then God won't forgive you. That's just another way to back what works to the gospel. And those people are the ones who are not obeying the truth. And they're the ones that are going to have, they're going to rail against the believer and buffet you for your faults and just put on a facade of religion and make the believers, you know, think that they have to earn something from God. Um, but that's not right at all. That's not what Peter's saying here at all. Um, just to let you know if, if you've been taught that, because I was taught that at a, at a former Calvary Chapel that I went to, um, Calvary Chapel Los Alamitos. That's what the pastor there taught, that in order to be forgiven today, I have to make sure I have no unforgiveness in my heart. And if I want to make sure that God hears my prayers and answers them, then I have to live like, you know, this, you know, perfectly. Um, or at least try my best to love the Lord with all my heart, some mind and strength. You know, all that's the law. And he's the same one that believes in tithing and all that, which is the law. So you have to separate yourselves. If you have the freedom, I had to separate myself from that church. If you have the freedom, then move. I know some people that don't have any, any choice. And so they, and they can't really do anything. And so they, they leave that religious, legalistic environment and they get persecuted. I got persecuted. My, my conscience is good before the Lord. And other people are seeing the, the liberty and joy that I have in Christ, the rest that I have in Christ. And when they see me, they don't see me trying to, they don't see me producing fruit and works <laughs> because they have a religious mindset of that, but they don't know that my heart is a well-watered garden full of the fruits of Christ and his righteousness. And other people are being set free. There's a speaking that he's wrought in me now. <laughs> through my buffeting, through my, per, through the persecution, through, because Christ is being real to me in the moment where, uh, you know, it, family members look down upon me because I had to leave that r religious institution. They can't see, how can you not go to church on a Sunday anymore? And the people from that church, some people saw that, w why I left. And they're like, wow, I was experiencing the exact same thing. And they left, and some people experience the exact same thing. But they're like, they're afraid of if I don't, if I leave, then I don't, then I'm gonna be persecuted. People are gonna think that I'm backslidden, and I have nowhere else to go. And so they're 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 staying right there, and they're still getting beat up by that pastor. It's sad. And so if they're in, if you're in that situation where you feel like you just can't, if you you know there's no other, there's nothing I can do, then you have to come forward by the blood of Jesus Christ and just know, hey, Christ is the shepherd of of my soul. I'm, I don't have to be afraid of, you know, whatever your fears are, you don't have to be afraid. Let Christ be your reality today. He's going to lead you into green pastures. Um, we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and that he will provide fellowship. I have plenty of fellowship. And, and my mind is, and my mind and my heart and what I'm listening to is not filled with a mixture of law and grace anymore it's it's grace it's christ himself and he's making his home in my heart through faith and that's not something that i that i did that i accomplished no it's through my weakness i was so weak that i couldn't stay in that church <laughs> and even when i talked to the pastor about the 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 law righteousness that he was teaching um he said I wasn't walking in love <laughs> and he started attacking me and, and he started buffeting me for my faults he made it a character issue and it's like all right you know what I couldn't say anything else 
All I can do is sanctify the Lord in my heart, know who I am in Christ, and I'm accepted in the beloved. And for me to say anything else would just make the situation worse. And then he's going to continue to buffet me and buffet me and buffet me for my faults. And all I can do is entrust myself to my faithful creator, my faithful and merciful high priest who intercedes for me, who knows how it is to be persecuted by the Pharisees and the religious crowd. And, you know, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. And it's... I'm fellowshipping with him and his sufferings and the life of Christ is wrought in me and that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. That's all I can say. All I know is that there's people that know what I went through and they've gone through the same thing and they're experiencing the life of Christ. Now, being in an institutional church for 30 years, now they're finally experiencing Christ's life, being released from years and years of condemnation and mixture of law and grace and the rejoicing with joy unspeakable, full of glory. Christ is being put on display, and we're showing the fourth the praises of Christ, who's called us out of darkness, called us out of religion, called us out of man pleasing, and building uh, a reputation for ourselves in the religious crowd, and called us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, into His marvelous light, and the reality of Christ is really um, real to us. And there's a deeper fellowship that we have through the blood of Christ and the gospel. And we're becoming living stones as Peter, you know. Peter was the one that was like, hey, Lord, I'm going to live my, I'm going to leave, leave uh, lay down my life for you. And Jesus is like, no, no, Peter, where I'm going, you cannot come. Oh, <laughs> Jesus was saying the whole time, follow me, pick up your cross. And well, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'll follow you to the end. If, if I'll forsake you, I'll forsake you. Nope, Peter, surely as the rooster crows, you you would have denied me three times. Okay, that was the Peter we we saw. Why? In, in the Gospels, why? Well, the whole point of the law, Jesus taught the law, the impossibility of discipleship. That is not how we live the Christian life now. It requires death. Christ had to go to the cross. And Peter had to see that I don't love the Lord. I don't agape you as I thought I did. The whole point of the... Ten Commandments and the discipleship that Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, and Luke was to show the impossibility that requires death. And so in John, we see that Christ took up his cross. And the discipleship is not trying to you pick up your cross and you love the Lord with all your heart. You, you, you better love your neighbor as yourself and this and that. No, Christ laid down his life. And our discipleship today is to abide in the gospel. And how do we know that we abide in the gospel? Well, he's given us the spirit, which is eternal life. It's true. It's acknowledging what is true in Christ. And the truth sets us free. And the world will know that we are his disciples um, because of that. So don't listen to the pastors who try to bring you back under Jesus' earthly teaching as far as him speaking the law to the circumcision and showing them the impossibility of discipleship. But you want to listen to your shepherd who's leading you into rest. The true New Testament ministry that God gave to Paul, for the church that gives you Christ as life, sanctification, righteousness, and redemption. And I, through the law, died to the law that I might live in the God. Uh, Paul says, I died to the world, and the, wor the world to me, the religious world. And I reckon myself dead and due to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And Christ is my life. And the just shall live by faith. The New Testament ministry, we want to we listen to... New Testament ministry, not the letter that kills, but the spirit that gives life. And you'll know by the speaking. Um, there really is a fragrance, there's a taste. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is gracious. We, we, we can taste. There, there's a taste of Christ. Um, so, there's a lot there. kind of went on a little tangent, but hope someone is edified by that. And we'll continue the rest in the next message.